The Radical. Fundamental principles of freedom, rational self-interest, and individual rights. This is The Yaron Brook Show. All right, everybody, welcome to Yaron Brook Show on this Sunday afternoon. I hope everybody's having a fantastic weekend. Hope you caught the show yesterday and you're back for some more today. All right, we're going to be talking about conservatives, national conservatives in particular. I've actually found a conservative I like. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, but um, yeah, today we'll, we'll be discussing the uh, National Conservative Manifesto. Manifesto, I have it. Uh, well, it's a statement of principle, which I'm calling the manifesto. It's close enough. It's like a manifesto. Anyway, it's 10 principles. We'll talk about the 10 principles. And I'm sure you're going to get excited about voting for your Republican candidates um, uh, soon after after we read this. Uh, I see Linda missed yesterday, but Linda, you can catch it. You can catch still. It's on YouTube. You, you don't have to miss any your own book show. You can watch it after the fact on YouTube. No problem. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Ashton. Thank you, Michael. You guys got us off right off the bat uh, before we even got started. I just reminded everybody we've got a goal, $650 a show in the Super Chat. Uh, Catherine is here to kind of encourage you on and, and to get us going. Uh, we, we, we're off to a great start. We've already uh, done $72, so we've done better than 10%, basically before the show even started. So uh, that's that's always good. It's a great opportunity to ask me a question, and it's a great opportunity just to support the show. I also want to mention our um, our two sponsors uh, of the show. We've got uh, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN, if you go, uh, I just got a, a small check from ExpressVPN uh, from the sponsorship uh, that I have there. So if you go to uh, expressvpn.com slash Iran, uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm a little quiet, I'm never quiet. If anybody else thinks I'm quiet, let me know. I can increase the volume, but uh, this, this, I think this is the same volume I used yesterday. Uh, anyway, expressvpn.com slash Iran will give you three extra free months of ExpressVPN. I use ExpressVPN when I travel. I use it uh, to do my banking. I use it uh, to get into uh, HBO when I'm out of the country. Uh, I, I, you know, I use it to... Yeah, when I, we need some extra privacy, I use ExpressVPN. You can use it as well. Uh, second sponsor is FountainheadCasts.com. FountainheadCasts.com. You know how to spell that. FountainheadCasts, one word. Um, uh, FountainheadCasts uh, uh, produces casts, beautiful casts of classic uh, sculpture. And uh, right now, I think, let me just find this. Where is it? Uh, had it here. Two, two, two. Yes. Um, if you're in the lower 48 states, uh, you get free shipping on orders over $100. I can't in Puerto Rico because I'm in the kind of lower than the lower 48 states. Um, if you use the promo code Yaron, just use the promo code Yaron, you get 10% off your order. So you can get free shipping and 10%. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, this website is called the Fountainhead Gipsoteca, 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 uh, but all you need to know, you don't have to spell Gipsoteca, all you need to know is fountainheadcast.com, go there, get some, um, get some, uh, casts, uh, he is a good supporter of the show, good listener to the show, and a good supporter of the show, um, and has been sponsor of the show. All right, let's get Rolling. Uh, before we get to a discussion of um, the uh, National Conservatives, which we will, I want to talk about another group of conservatives. Uh, this group of conservatives is actually in the UK. I don't know if you know, but Boris Johnson has uh, resigned, and now there is a vote within the Conservative Party to choose his successor. Uh, the first phases of the vote. Members of Parliament vote, uh, and then they pick two. The two that get the most votes within the members of Parliament then go to a popular vote among the members of the Conservative Party. So you have to be a member of the Conservative Party to, to vote. And right now, there are five candidates, five candidates, 
Um, it, it's it, it, the selection is interesting for a number of different reasons. One of them being uh, just the the diversity of the candidates. Of the candidates, three are women. Uh, two are either immigrants or children of immigrants. Uh, one from uh, Nigeria and one from uh, India, I think. Uh, it, it's it's an incredibly diverse group. It's an incredibly uh, it, it's an interesting group. But I have a favorite candidate. Um, unusual, you know. I never endorse candidates, but in this case, I am. I, granted, I have some limited knowledge, and and maybe you'll tell me. Uh, that she has some bad uh, views, but I've met one of the candidates. Actually, one of the candidates was on stage with me in a socialism versus capitalism debate in which she was on my side on capitalism. And you can see the video. It's, uh, it's I don't know if I've ever put it up on my website, but it's on the Institute of Art and Ideas um, uh, website. It's been viewed by 94,327 people. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, one of the most viewed videos, I think. Anyway, it's, it's, um, me and Kemi Badenoch, me and Ken, Kenny Badenoch, I think I'm pronouncing her name right, uh, versus, uh, Leo, uh, Panitech, Pan, Pani, Panich, Leo Panich, and, uh, the moderator, who was pretty leftist, um, and it was great. Uh, she agreed with almost everything I said. She supported everything I said. What she said was good, was solid, pro-capitalist. I mean, she was better than any American politician I've ever met. She was intelligent. She was smart. She was friendly. She was personable. Uh, so it was, um, uh, this was fantastic. Oh, Taisy said she was there in, in the audience. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, so Taisy was in the audience. She, so here's a, a British politician, uh, I guess she's just a secretary or attorney general right now. She's running, um, she's running for, uh, she's running for the premiership. She probably won't win it this time, but she's getting a lot of visibility and she's getting national exposure. She's the daughter of Nigerian immigrants. She grew up in Nigeria. She was born in the UK, but she grew up in Nigeria and in the United States. And uh, she's about as pro-capitalism as a politician can be. So um, she's fantastic. So I encourage you to go watch this video. It's, I'll put the link in the chat. You can, uh, you can see the, the link is in the chat right there. Um, so uh, there you go. It's, you can see me and, and Kemi. She gave me a business card, told me to look her up when I was in London. We had a very friendly exchange. Unfortunately, I never looked her up. If I'd known within a few years she was going to run for the premiership um, uh, and become Prime Minister of the UK, I would have looked her up. I should have looked her up anyway. You know, I'm so bad at, at the schmoozing part, at the getting to know people part, at the contact part, uh, but it, it, it would have been incredibly valuable. I, I could have been her economic advisor. Now that she's run, she's, you know, she might be uh, too important to, to want to meet with me, but I can try. I can try. Anyway, um, yes, I was surprised that uh, this is the same, um, uh, uh, it was not an ARUK event. This was not an Ayn Rand UK event. This was an Institute of Art and Ideas event, and this was in, um, uh, this was in Wales, in a tent in Wales. It was the uh, festival, this is the largest festival of philosophy and art in the world. Um, and it's in Wales, and uh, I can't remember when this was, 2018 maybe, um, and uh, they invited me and I participated. Oh, 2019, March of 2019. And uh, so uh, uh, Tessie, Tessie wasn't there, um, but there were a lot of people. The, the audience was packed, the, the thing was packed. Most of the audience were leftists. This is uh, very much a festival that is primarily of the left. Um, but... Uh, yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because I know you guys think I'm so anti anybody who calls herself conservative, and mostly I am. But there's there's one that um, who you know I like, and she was great, and uh, I hope I hope I hope she wins. I, I doubt she'll win, but I hope she does really well, and that maybe in the future she can win. Right? 
And who knows? You, you just never know in these things. Um, all right, bloody Wales. Yes, it was in rainy, wet, soggy, muddy Wales, and it was all, all the events were intense, and, and you had to walk through the mud to get to the different events, and it, it just was not fun. Not fun. Not fun. Anyway. All right, so uh, as you know, uh, I am, uh, have been following kind of the, the right, uh, the different segments within the right uh, in particular. What interests me right now and what is going to, you know, what I'm going to be following uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, few months, years, is uh, the intellectuals on the right, the, the, the rise of intellectuals on the right and how, kind of how they position themselves uh, on the right. If you think about intellectuals of the right in the past, um, you know, in the past, the conservative movement was kind of, uh, is described as this three-legged stool. It, 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 it tried to uh, bring together three different types of conservatives and, and, uh, and give them a home. Um, the, the foreign policy conservatives, the anti-communists, the tough foreign policy types, uh, they were one leg of the school. M many of those you would call today the neoconservatives. Another leg of the schools were kind of the free market types. Uh, they, they called them the libertarian conservatives, the ones who cared about economic liberty and thought economic liberty was really important, and they were the second leg of the stool. And the third leg of the stool was the, the kind of the religious conservatives, the, 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 the social conservatives, the ones who cared mostly about social issues, and the central issue for them was, uh, was religion. And uh, many of the intellectual, conservative intellectuals kind of tried to, to have a piece of all three. If you think of William Buckley, he was tough on communism, he was also religious conservatives, he was also a, a um, supposedly pro-market, but they were, I mean, they were kind of mealy mouth about uh, almost everything. It wasn't like they were, uh, 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 with few exceptions, out to really conquer the world. It wasn't an established American empire. It wasn't like um, they, uh, uh, they were truly free market. They always hedged that. Uh, and it wasn't like they were truly wanted a theocracy. They wanted some application. And generally, you would have to say they were fairly uh, mealy mouth. They weren't that many of them. I mean, the conservative movement wasn't known as necessarily as this big intellectual movement. Um, and what united them, really, ultimately. Uh, what united them was altruism, right? What united them was a commitment to altruism and, and a defense of capitalism based on altruism, uh, capitalism, small, you know, kind of capitalism, a, a, a weak capitalism, a defense of America that was based on altruism. We will bring democracy to the world because it's our responsibility, it's our duty. And of course, uh, altruism that is all over religion and, and the need to bring about kind of religion into the culture. This conservative coalition, uh, this conservative movement, uh, you know, again, neoconservatives were certainly a part of it, and then uh, the, the, um, um, uh, the national, what do you call it, uh, the magazine that uh, Buckley started, you know, they were all, uh, they represented as the intellectuals uh, much of the conservative movement. There were others that were more religious, less religious. But I think what has happened uh, more recently is, well, what's happened with Trump is that that coalition got shattered. What happened with Trump is that that coalition got completely uh, blown up. Basically, many people, the National Review, thank you, many people in the National Review and many people uh, who self-identified as neoconservatives became part of uh, the Never Trump movement, Never Trump, and basically became sidelined in the Republican Party, in the conservative movement. Uh, you know, some of them, uh, Irving, uh, not Irving Crystal, uh, uh, Bill Crystal, Irving Crystal's son, even joined the Democratic Party, as far as I can tell. Um, so many of them, I think Max Boot, uh, a famous neocon, I think has also now joined the Democratic Party. So many of them became never Trumpers and became basically irrelevant to the conservative movement. Yes, you've got the, the, the David Frenches and the Jonah Goldbergs uh, at Dispatch. I think the Dispatch is an important publication. 
But I don't think they have much sway within conservatism. I think they've been marginalized, they've been put aside. They represent the old uh, conservatives. They, they, they try to defend capitalism based on altruism. They try to present the case for uh, the founding fathers. They, this is a, the other part that the conservatives try to do is try to present themselves as representing the founding fathers. They, try to, they still try to make it a kind of an altruistic case for capitalism. They, they, they're still have a uh, America, uh, kind of uh, a tough America foreign policy. Um, they want religion in the state, but not too much. They're kind of moderates when it comes to that. Uh, and, and, and a lot of that, they've kind of won with, with the repeal of Roe versus Wade. The religious part of the conservative movement is basically one, at least one big aspect of it, you know, as, as we've seen. Ted Cruz today uh, let the world know that he's against gay marriage and the Supreme Court should rule to overturn that. So the cultural war will continue, uh, but, but they've, they've got a big victory there. Anyway, so the, 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 you know, the Constitution, the ones who still claim uh, adherence to the Constitution, the ones that are still devoted to some semblance of free markets and individual liberty, and they still claim to be classical liberal in some sense, that is, pro-individualism in some sense, they are part of, I think, the Never Trump movement and be marginalized. And I'm not going to talk about much about the Trump movement itself. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. I think one, uh, the, the rest of the conservative movement has basically, uh, you know, been divided into uh, several uh, segments. Um, one being the National Conservatives, which we'll talk about in a minute. One being uh, the illiberal theocratic conservatives. So these are people who are, are of you know, the religious right, but now they've taken off any pretense, any pretense of separation of church and state. They, they want to impose morality through the state. They want to impose their Catholic Christian morality through the state. Uh, you know, I'll talk more about them on another show. But they are the Patrick Deneens, the, the Soha Bamaris, the, the uh, 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 Vermeule from, from Harvard. Um, uh, and these are real intellectuals. Um, there's the, uh, there's the uh, uh, National Conservatives. Oh, so the National Conservatives, the Theocrats. And then I would say there's a whole group of, of alt-rights, right? The, the, the real, the crazies, the, um, um, uh, the Bronze Age pervert. But, but not just that. Just a whole bunch of kind of uh, a variety of different racists, a variety of different um, uh, just beyond the pale kind of weird uh, alt right types uh, that 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 are not very intellectual. And indeed, they're anti intellectual. Yeah, Alex Jones would belong over there, and and uh, and, and a bunch of others. Unfortunately, it's not a small piece, but it's an anti intellectual piece. Now, there's one other piece uh, of this, uh, which is. I'd say the Trumpist piece, and that is, uh, again, anti-intellectual, non-intellectual, anti-intellectual, and it is basically much more centered around uh, power, around Trump, the personality worship of Trump, and, and, and pragmatism. So it's not about any kind of set of ideas. It's about what we need in order to establish power, what we need in order to defeat the left. And of course, with all of these, there's overlap. All of them overlap somewhat, right? So I'm going to spend time over the next few months, years, on all of these, right? On all of these, I'm going to I'm going to talk about e each one of these groups. You know, one of my big pushes over the next couple of years is to try to do as much as I can to undermine them as much as possible. And and you know, the one group that I am most supportive of. Uh, the weakest group, which is which is the kind of the the, the dispatch, the uh, those kind of the the anti the anti Trumpers, the never Trumpers. Uh, but my goal is to undermine, is to show the corruption, to show the intellectual evil that is behind many of these uh, uh, conservative groups. And uh, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of them. If Trump runs for president, we'll be talking a lot about Trump because my goal there will be to the extent that I have a little bit of influence, probably even less than that, probably it's smaller, it's right there, it's infinitesimal. Um, uh, the, to the extent that I have that influence, I'd like to try to 
uh, influence Republicans not to vote for Trump and to and to vote for any anybody but Trump. Um, so uh, today we're going to start with the National Conservatives. And the thing about the National Conservatives is, I, you know, I have a friendly relationship with one of the guys who is the founder, is is a big deal within the National Conservative movement. He is uh, uh, the organizer. He just, just wrote a new book on conservatism, which I've got on my desk here, which I'm supposed to read. Um, and he sent me uh, uh, he sent me a link. Uh, that's uh, Yoram Chazoni, and I debated him, and I did the I did the um, I did the Lex Friedman show with him, and hopefully in the future we'll do other things where I debate him. We'll, we'll see if we can create the right kind of venues for those kind of debates. But uh, he sent me a link to um, uh, this is a couple of months ago, or maybe a few weeks ago, uh, to National Conservatism: A Statement of Principles. Uh, and this was published in the uh, in the publication, The American Conservative. It's online. You can find it. I'll actually, uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat uh, right now so you have it. Uh, but this is a link. Whoops. That didn't work. Why is that not copying? Okay, let me try that again. Uh, copy URL, and then we go here, and then we put paste. But it won't paste. Huh. Sounds like it will do it a different way. All right, so um, this is an article that sets out 10 principles of the National Conservative Movement. And I thought, well, the, the best way to address the National Conservative Movement is basically to discuss their 10 principles and to look at them. So we have them right here. Um, I, I don't know, do, would you guys value me putting them up on screen? We could, uh, we could do that. Uh, let, me, let me see if we can put that up on screen. Uh, I think that will, oops, that didn't work. Um, that's putting me up on screen. That's not the right one. All right, there it is. All right, not, that's not it either because, there we go. All right, there it is. It's a little too big. That's not good. Huh. We'll see. Shrink it. There we go. So there it is, right? The um, the National Conservative ten principles. Now we're going to talk about these. I want you to note before we even get started the things that are not there, right? The things that are not there. Um, and, and, and the first thing you will notice, and, and uh, we'll look at all 10, and, and you can read them along with me, and we can look for them, um, is the fact that the individual is not mentioned, maybe once. Liberty is not mentioned, maybe once. Capitalism is not mentioned, certainly not mentioned. Um, rights, rights, the concept of rights, the concept of individual rights, and I've been railing over this issue because of Rosa versus Wade and the idea that, uh, you know, uh, uh, nobody on the right cares about rights, the Supreme Court doesn't seem to care about rights, nobody really cares about rights, they don't have an understanding of rights, they don't think about rights. Rights, individual rights, don't make an appearance, don't make an appearance on the National Conservative platform. So just consider that. This might be, I think right now, the biggest, most influential of all the conservative movements out there, among the intellectuals. They're the ones, I think, that are going to set the agenda for the future of the conservative movement. Future of the conservative movement. Individualism, nah. Capitalism, nah. Individual rights, the founding concept of America, nah. None of those. This is where Trump has bought us. There's not a single, you know, uh, uh, significant. They mention Constitution, not particularly the U.S. Constitution, as we'll see, because this is a, a, a globalist. No, not globalist, an international movement. I was kidding. I, I, I you know, they're against globalism, the anti-concept of globalism, which means nothing. All right, so let's look at this. The first one is national independence, national independence. And this one's interesting. 
We wish to see a world of independent nations. Cool, so do I. Each nation capable of self-government should chart its own course in accordance with its own particular constitutional, linguistic, and religious inheritance. Each has a right to maintain its own borders and conduct policies that will benefit its own people. We endorse a policy of rearmament by independent self-governing nations and of defensive alliances whose purpose is to deter imperialist aggressions. What is missing from this statement? What is missing from this statement? What's missing from the statement is freedom. Each nation capable of safe government should chart its own course. What if that course is authoritarian? What if its constitution allows authoritarianism? And of course, what dictates the course of a nation? Constitution, OK. Linguistic. Note linguistic, right? What's really important is language. Really? Wouldn't it be cooler if every country in the world spoke English? Cut. Language, that's what's crucial. That's what defines a nation and religious inheritance. So this is all about the past, all about tradition, all about where you came from, all about your ethnic group, all about your tribe. Where is freedom? I mean, I get having a, a political principle, one of those being national independence, you want independent nation states, but wouldn't you say I want to see independent nation states that preserve freedom, protect the rights of their citizens, or even if you don't want to use the concept of rights, at least some semblance of non-authoritarianism? No. It, 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 they don't care. You can be a democracy. You can be a constitutional republic. You can be a authoritarian state. You can be uh, Putin. You can be Xi. You can be any one of these people. Any one of these people, as long as, as long as you're governing in accordance with a constitution, it doesn't say, it doesn't say uh, whether it's a good constitution, bad constitution, what the purpose of the constitution is. It doesn't say any of that. Uh, as long as you speak the language of your forebearers, and as long as you respect religion, you're cool. Putin qualifies here completely. So does Xi, by the way. So does Xi. So national independence, not individual sovereignty, God forbid, not individualism, not freedom, not rights, national independence. Second, rejection of imperialism and globalism. Now note, like, I don't like imperialism, and you know, if you mean by globalism, one world government, I don't like that either. But why is this negative number two? Number two. Now, what's fascinating about here is, is the, the moral equivalency that we're going to see. So he says, we support a system of free cooperation and competition among nation states. Working together through trade treaties, defense alliances, and other common projects that respect the independence of their members. Again, nothing about an alliance of free countries or authoritarian, nothing, right? I mean, how about we reject authoritarianism before we reject imperialism, globalism? No, we're not going to do that, right? But we oppose transferring the authority of elected governments to transnational or supernatural bodies. I oppose that too. A trend that uh, uh, pretends to high moral legitimacy, even as it weakens representative government, sows public alienation and distrust, and strengthens the influence of autocratic regimes. Why, is, why are you against autocratic regimes? I haven't seen a principle here that's anti-autocratic regimes. Accordingly, they say, we reject imperialism in its various con contemporary forms. We condemn the imperialism of China, Russia. This is why it's in here. It's to distance themselves a little bit from Russia. But no the moral equivalency now, and other authoritarian powers. And then he says, but also, we also oppose the liberal imperialism of the last generation, which sought to gain power, influence, and wealth by dominating other nations and trying to remake them in its own image. What they don't want 
is classical idea, liberal ideas spread around the world. That to them is imperialism. Classical liberal ideas, Western ideas, the ideas of the Enlightenment, that to them is imperialism. Going to the rest of the world and saying, look, the best system of government is the American system of government. The best system of government is freedom, individualism, a, a system based on those ideas that respects the rights of its citizens. That is the liberal order which they oppose. That is liberal imperialism. And of course, they lump in together, so that is the equivalent of, right? That is the equivalent of uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and, and uh, Chinese, I don't know, taking over uh, Tibet and, and maybe wanting to take over Taiwan and so on. Unbelievable. And note again, what they're really all about, and this came out in my debate with Yoram Khazoni, what they're really all about is a rejection of individualism. What they're really all about is a rejection of individual liberty. This is a collectivist, explicitly collectivist movement that is not about preserving the rights of the individual, but is all about preserving traditions It's all about nationalism. It's all about tribalism. All right, national government, maybe here they'll tell us a little bit about the purpose of government. What's the purpose of government, right? What, 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 what are governments instituted among men to do? Maybe we'll find out from this. Abu Yin says he has $1,000 ready. Well, what's going on? Where is it, Abu Yin? 10,000. He says he's got $10,000 already. All right. Ooh, we've got a lot of Super Chat questions. This is great. Thank you, guys. Uh, got, uh, lots of questions. It's good. So be a long show today. All right. Third is national government. The independent nation state is instituted to establish a more perfect union among the diverse communities, parties, and regions of a given nation to provide for their common defense and justice among them and to secure the general welfare and the blessings of liberty for this time and for future generations. Okay, liberty, one appearance. There it is, liberty. Liberty for whom? Notice, no individual is mentioned here. To preserve a perfect union among diverse communities, parties, and regions for the common defense and justice among all general welfare and blessing of liberty for whom? For this and for future generations. I mean, this is horrible. We believe in a strong but limited state. Limited by what principle? Limited by what principle? Subject to constitutional restraints and a division of power. Constitutional restraints and division of power aimed at what? We recommend a dramatic reduction in the scope and administrative state and the policymaking judiciary and displaced le uh, the displaced legislature representing the full range of the nation's interests and values. This is the point uh, with the Supreme Court as well. So this Supreme Court is going to be very good at challenging the administrative state. Uh, we saw it in the EPA ruling, the last ruling before the, the break, where they said the EPA cannot regulate CO2 because Congress hasn't given them authority to do so and we, we won't allow regulatory agencies to do things that the law has not permitted them to do. Will we allow, allow the law to permit them to regulate these things? Yes, we're, we're great with the law. If it goes through the legislative process, we're good for, with it. We're not good, which is good, right? It's better than the alternative, right? I don't like these agencies doing whatever the hell they want. And that's a good thing. It's a step in the right direction. It's going gonna, it's gonna to limit uh, these regulatory agencies' power over our lives. But note here that they're not trying to reduce the scope for the sake of liberty, but it's for the sake of giving the power back to the legislature. And if the legislature wants to reduce our liberty, that's fine. 
They don't have a problem with that. We recommend the Federalist principle, which prescribes a delegation of power to the respective states, or the Federalists, of course, or subdivisions of the nation, nation so as to allow greater variation, experimentation, and freedom. However, in those states, this is really interesting, really interesting. In those states of subdivisions, in which the law and justice have been manifestly corrupted, or, this is an or, in which lawlessness, immorality, immorality, and disillusion reign, national government must intervene energetically to restore order. Immorality. Not just lawlessness. I get all lawlessness, right? But so if there's a state in which, I don't know, gays are allowed to marry, or in there's a state in which somebody is allowed to do something that the national government views as being immoral, not illegal, immoral, they should go in. Well, we know what code. We know exactly what code. The code of the religion prevailing in the state, in the country. We'll get to Christian country in a minute. We know exactly what code. It's the code of Christianity. So the federal government, they believe in federalism unless immorality is allowed in the state. Not violation of rights, not violation of the Constitution, not 14 Amendment stuff. You're doing something that we deem as immoral, we're going to intervene in the state, shut you down. The government, the federal government must intervene energetically to restore order. Energetically. All right. Four. Why did it only, why is this only number four? I thought this would be number one. God and public religion. No nation can long endure without humility and gratitude before God and fear of his judgment that are found in authentic religious tradition. God. How did this country survive? I don't think this country was founded on humility and gratitude. Maybe I'm misinterpreting the Founding Fathers, but that's not the sentiments I got from the Founding Fathers. For millennia, the Bible has been our surest guide, nourishing a fitting orientation towards God, to the political traditions of the nation, to public morals, to the defense of the weak, altruism, and to the recognition of things rightly regarded as sacred. This is very cringe. <laughs> Friend Harper says, holy shit is right. This is your new conservative movement. This is what Trump has brought to us. This, if you've read Dim, these are the intellectuals Leonard Peikoff warned us against. The Bible should be read as the first among the sources of a shared Western civilization in schools and universities, schools, and as the rightful inheritance of believers and non-believers alike. Where a Christian majority exists, pay attention, pay attention, where a Christian majority exists, Public life should be rooted in Christianity and its moral vision. That's America, if you hadn't noticed. And its moral vision. I'm going to read this again because this is striking. Where a Christian majority exists, public life should be rooted in Christianity and its moral vision, which should be honored by the state and other institutions, both public and private. Honored by the state. So no separation of church and state at all. Complete integration of religion with the state. At the same time, they write, Jews and other religious minorities are to be protected in the observance of their own traditions, uh, in the free government and, uh, of their communal institute, governance of their communal institutions, and in all matters pertaining to the rearing and education of their children. What about atheists? Adult individuals should be protected. Adult individuals should be protected from religious ideological coercion. Children, it's okay. In their private lives and in their homes. But children should not be protected from religious coercion because it's a Christian state. I I'll read you afterwards who signed this thing. 
I mean, this is scary stuff, guys. This is why I hate Trump so much, because this is what he made possible. This is what he brought out and elevated these intellectuals. These are the ones that inherited. The, now, maybe it would have happened anyway. Maybe. Five. Ashton says this is fascism. Well, let's see. Let's read number five. The rule of law. That sounds good. We believe in the rule of law. So do I. By this we mean that citizens and foreigners alike, and both the government and the people must accept and abide by the laws of the nation. W laws based on what? I mean, you know, Nazi Germany had laws. In America, this means accepting and living in accordance with the Constitution of 1787. Notice, uh, and the amendments to it, duly enacted statutory law and the great common law inheritance. All agree that the repair and improvement of national legal traditions and institutions is as times necessary. But necessary change must take place through the law. This is how we preserve our national traditions, tradition again, and our nation itself. Rioting, looting, and other unacceptable public disorders should be swiftly put to an end. Now, most of this I agree with, but note, what's the principle of law? I don't believe in the rule of law when the laws are horrific. I don't believe in the rule of law when the laws clearly violate individual rights. I mean, it was the rule of law that allowed for slavery. Slavery was the law. Is that OK? Should we just don't do anything? You have to, you have to go by the law. And then, you know, so that, that uh, you know, underground that, got, that freed slaves, that's illegal. You're violating the law. If you want to change the law, go through the regular process. None of this, none of this, uh, you know, smuggling slaves out of the South. Six. All right, we're finally getting to one. Maybe you guys are like, maybe, we'll see. Free enterprise, right? Not free markets, not capitalism, free enterprise. Okay, we'll take it, free enterprise, better than nothing. We believe that an economy based on private property and free enterprise is best suited to promoting the prosperity of the nation and accords with traditions of individual liberty. They, they believe in individual liberty because of the tradition of individual liberty that are central to the Anglo-American political tradition. What about if you're not part of the Anglo-American? Well, then you don't have to have free to enterprise. We reject the socialist principle which supposes that economic activity of the nation can be conducted in accordance with a rational plan dictated by the state. All right, you guys, you know, okay, these conservatives, might, they might not be too bad. But the free market cannot be absolute. Uh-oh. Economic policy must serve the general welfare of the nation. Nationalism, tribalism, collectivism, altruism. Today... Globalized markets allow hostile foreign powers to despoil America and other countries of their manufacturing capabilities, weaken them economically and dividing them internally. At the same time, transnational corporations showing little loyalty to any nation demand public life, damage public life by censoring political speech, flooding the country with dangerous and addictive substances and pornography, and promoting obsessive, destructive personal habits. <laughs> Oh my God, the enemy. Destructive personal habits, you guys. Maybe listening to your own book show is one of those destructive personal habits that those uh, corporations are inflicting upon you. God. A prudent national economic policy, note this, should promote free enterprise, but it must also mitigate threats to the national interest aggressively pursue economic independence from hostile powers, nurture industries crucial to national defense, and restore and upgrade manufacturing capabilities critical to the public welfare. Who gets to decide all that? Well, a central planner, of course. Crony capitalism, the selective promotion of corporate profit-making by organs of the state power, should be energetically exposed and opposed. How are you going to do that if you're the government? is going to nurture industries crucial for national defense, going to restore and upgrade manufacturing capabilities. Isn't that the essence of cronyism? 
isn't the only way that can happen is through cronyism? So tariffs, great. Trade restrictions, great. Unsuring, great. Choosing winners and losers, as long as it's in manufacturing. You know, we won't do it in services like programming and stuff like that. All the programming jobs can go overseas. Go programming, please go. You can go to China. We want manufacturing. We want to be good at what human beings did 100 years ago. That's what we're going to be good at. We're going to be good at the stuff we were good at in the past, because that's our tradition. We are traditionally a manufacturing country, so traditionally we should still be a manufacturing company. country. Let's forget about all that high tech. Let's forget about all that software and programming, and st that's all services. That's no good. We don't want that. I mean, this obsession that people have, this, this weird kind of obsession over manufacturing is, again, tradition-bound. It's, it's a little barbaric and primitive and, and, and just weird. I find it really, really weird. It's, it's trying to suck up to, the, to, to, I guess, the working class, right? It's to suck up to voters, uh, or certain, some voters. But it's sure to alienate uh, anybody who doesn't happen to be in manufacturing. Wow, it's already, gee, we've been going a long time. Okay, public research. Public research. This is, this is just in the same breath as free enterprise. Now we're public research. I did, I did a show on the public research just a little while ago at the government funding of science. Public research. At a time when China is rapidly overtaking American and Western nations in fields crucial for security and defense, a Cold War-type program modeled on DARPA, the Moonshot, and SDI is needed to focus large-scale public resources on scientific and technological research with military application, on restoring and upgrading national manufacturing, manufacturing again capacity, and on education in the physical sciences and engineering. I don't know why physical science and engineering today don't necessarily lead to manufacturing. Biotech is not manufacturing. God. On the other hand, we recognize that most universities, they hate the universities, right, because the universities are leftists. They don't, wanna, they don't want them to get the money. Uh, but note this. This is super important. On the other hand, we recognize that most universities at, the, at, uh, at this point Partisan and globalist in orientation and vehemently opposed to nationalist and conservative ideas. Such institutions do not deserve taxpayer support unless they re rededicate themselves to the national interest. Education policy should serve manifest national needs. In other words, you're not going to get research grants. You're not going to get money from the government. You're not going to get Defense Department government money unless the ideas taught at university are accepted acceptable to the regime, acceptable to the government. Educated policy should manifest national needs. In other words, we will not support universities that are not part of our agenda, that are not teaching our ideas. Now, that's the end of free speech. It is the end of liberty. It is the control, complete control by government, not only of research, not only of industry, not only of manufacturing, but of ideas. So we've already got no separation between state and church. Now we have no separation between state and ideas. Ideas, only good ideas, are going to be promoted by the state. Only good ideas will be subsidized. Bad ideas will not be subsidized by the state. And subsidized here means big bucks public research. The Department of Education has to serve their ideological interests, their ideological demands. Eight, family and children. We believe that the traditional family is the source of society's virtues and deserves greatest support from public policy. Again, free enterprise, but we're going to subsidize families. The traditional family, built around a lifelong bond between a man and a woman and a lifelong bond between parents and children, is the foundation of all other achievements of our civilization. That is so ahistorical. That is so BS. The traditional family 
is the foundation of all achievements of our civilization? Michelangelo, as far as I know, never married, did not belong to a traditional family, was probably gay, we don't know, and yet is one of the great achievers of our civilization. Leonardo da Vinci, almost certainly gay, had no children, had no family. Leonardo da Vinci. Isaac Newton. Now, did Isaac Newton have children? I can't remember if he got married. Wait, is, is, the, is the thing that made it possible for Isaac Newton is, is his children, his family? I could go on and on and on. Really? Ayn Rand, of course, never had kids. And, and you know, she might have had an affair. Um, really? So, again, the traditional family is the foundation of all achievements of our civilization. All achievements of our civilization. Not most, not some, all. Albert Einstein, I don't think he was part of, part of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, he, he had uh, he divorced at least twice, once, maybe twice. Um, did Beethoven have kids? I'm sure Thomas knows that. Beethoven, I don't think Beethoven has kids. Did Mozart? Obviously, their achievements don't count as achievements of our civilization because obviously they didn't have kids. They, they didn't have a, a, a lifelong bond between a man and a woman, right? So obviously, their achievements are, are, are to not, are to not. Yeah. I mean, we could go on and on. Chopin, did Chopin have kids? Did Hugo? I don't even know family of Hugo. See, that's the thing. When I think about great geniuses and great achievement of Western civilization, I don't think about their family. Isn't that a shock? A surprise? Weird. Huh. None of them were family men. Weird. George Washington had no kids. What's wrong with George Washington? I mean, obviously, he's not part of our civilization. I go on. The disintegration of the family included a marked decline in marriage and childbirth gravely threatens the well-being and sustainability of democratic nations. Among the causes are an unconstrained individualism. Oh, my God. Individualism is the cause for all these civilizational problems. Unconstrained individualism that regards children as a burden while encouraging even more radical forms of sexual license and experimentation. Oh, my God as an alternative to the responsibilities of family and congregational life, economic and cultural conditions that foster stable family and congregational life and child raising are priorities of the highest order. All right, none of those geniuses who contributed to our civilization, achievements of our civilization, had regular family lives. And uh, I have to say, as somebody who's probably had some sexual license and experimentation, but also had has a wife, I don't know how they, how, how do they? These people are a little obsessed with, I think, sexual license and experimentation, just, just a little. All right, immigration. Immigration, do you think we agree on immigration? Maybe we agree on immigration. Immigration has made an immense contribution to the strength and prosperity of Western nations. Yes, they threw me a bone. But today's penchant for uncontrolled and unassimilated immigration has become a source of weakness and instability, not strength and dynamism, threatening internal dissension, and ultimately dissolution of the political economy, community. We note that Western nations have benefited from both liberal and restrictive immigration policies at various times. So the tradition is mixed. The tradition is mixed. We call for much more restrictive policies until these countries summon the wit to establish more balanced, productive, and assimilationist policies. Restrictive policies may sometimes include a moratorium on immigration. Just in case you were worried, they want to ban all immigration. There's no question about that. They, they're giving you, throwing a bone, but they don't believe it. They don't stand by it at all. Finally, um, race. We believe that all men are created in the image of God and that public policy should reflect that fact. 
huh, so we should, how do you reflect the fact that all people are uh, uh, created in the image of a make-believe? I don't know how you do that. Um, what kind of public policy is reflected in the make-belief, in the fact that we all like the make-belief? No person's worth or loyalties can be judged by the shape of their features, the color of his skin, or the results of a lab test. Huh. All right. The history of racialist ideology and oppression and its ongoing consequences requires us to emphasize this truth. We condemn the use of state and private institutions to discriminate and divide us among against one another on the basis of race. The cultural sympathies encouraged by a decent nationalism. This is interesting. The cultural sympathies encouraged by a decent nationalism offer a sound basis for conciliation and unity among diverse communities. Cultural sympathies. The nationalism we espouse respects and indeed combines the unique needs of particular minority communities and the common good of the nation as a whole. I mean, really? I doubt it. All right. Um, I want to give you a sense of who signed this. And, and maybe these are people you know or don't know, but um, I can tell you a little bit about them. Michael Anton. Michael Anton is, um, is famous for Flight 93, which was an essay he wrote in 2016 advocating for um, everybody to vote for Trump with the idea that uh, the left was so dominant uh, the world was coming to an end. Um, uh, the only chance civilization had was a very, very small chance, that is, of rushing the cockpit. And the equivalent of rushing the cockpit in the election, election was voting for Donald Trump. It was an incredibly important essay, very influential. Uh, Michael Anton has gone on to be a very influential intellectual on the right. He is uh, a professor at Tailsdale College, uh, but, but, uh, but way beyond that of uh, great influence. Larry Oon, I think, is the president of Hillsdale College. Uh, Ambi Athi, I don't know who Amber is. Um, we've got another Hillsdale College person. We've got a few people from, from the Daily Wire, although interestingly enough, really interestingly enough, uh, Ben Shapiro did not sign this. Ben Shapiro is not one of the signatories to this. Do what you will for that. OK, we got a bunch of other people, um, uh, some from the National Review. Um, some uh, Ken Cunicelli from the Election Transparency Initiative. Victor Davis Hanson, who, uh, who uh, should know better, used to know better, used to be a good guy. I was a big fan of Victor Davis Hanson, still am of his books on, on uh, military history, but he's signed to this. Krista Muth, who was much better, used to be a, a relative free marketer, an anti-nationalist, uh, uh, much better than this. Uh, he ran the Institute for Economic Affairs for many years um, as part of this. Now he's at the Hudson Institute, but he used to be at, um, at the Institute for Economic Affairs. Uh, Jim DeMint, again, uh, who ran, I think, uh, Heritage, I think is, was better than this, used to be better than this, no longer, particularly uh, DeMuth was better than this. Um, let's see, who else? More Hudson Institute signees that I don't really know. Um, um, Let's see, Project 20, Edmund Burke Foundation um, in, in, from Israel. Yom Hazoni, of course, signed this. More National Review people from the Federalist. The Federalist is very uh, in line with this. Um, let's see, uh, Charlie, Charlie Kirk, who was heavily influenced by Ayn Rand when he was young. And now that he's a little bit less young, he is a real national conservative from Turning Point USA. Michael Knowles from Daily Wire, bunch of Daily Wire people here. Uh, let's see anybody else that I would know. From Unhood, uh, from the Claremont Institute, uh, you've got people from the Claremont, you've got people from the Danube Institute, uh, you've got people from New Direction in Poland, I know the people in New Direction, European Center for Law and Justice in France, more Claremont Institute people, more First Things, Town Hall, Chris Rufo from Manhattan Institute, awful, awful. Very disappointing, Chris. Uh, let's see, um, A. War College, uh, uh, Daniel Strand, Peter Thiel, Peter Thiel. Uh, let's see, anybody else with, yeah, more Claremont Institute. All right, Edmund Book Foundation. All right. 
what can I say? It's, this, is the, this is, in my view, uh, know who's not signed. Put Ben Shapiro aside, because Ben Shapiro thinks a bad, much better than this and, and is not signed. But know who's not signed. Uh, Patrick Deneen has not signed this. Um, Soha Bamawi has not signed it. Why did they not sign it? They didn't sign it because this doesn't go far enough. They didn't sign it because this doesn't commit the agenda to enough religion. They didn't sign it because this doesn't commit a complete rethinking of the Constitution. They didn't sign it because this isn't, this isn't theocratic enough. Yeah, Peter Thiel has become a real national conservative. By the way, Peter Thiel is backing two Senate candidates who have signed up for this agenda. Their signature is not here, but they basically signed up to, to, to this agenda, and they're backed 100% by Peter Thiel. One is J.D. Vance in Ohio, who's a national conservative, and the other one is Blake Masters in Arizona. Those two Republicans, in my view, need to lose in November. But those two Republicans are backed almost 100% by Peter Thiel. Uh, they are both endorsed by, uh, by Trump, and they are completely part of this agenda. Blake Masters is horrific in his agenda. His, his agenda is this national conservatism, which is awful. So uh, Peter Thiel is exactly here. And note that these guys are not the most consistent, not the most radical, not the most extreme. Pink has nothing to do with this. Pink is not here. I don't know why people are talking about Pinko over there. The real extreme people are the Catholic integrationalists who want a theocracy. And they didn't even sign this because this is too moderate for them. Spooky stuff, guys. Spooky stuff. Yeah, Elon Musk, I don't think, would sign this. But you never know what Elon Musk. It's hard to tell what he believes. All right. Let's see. Thanks, everybody. Um, and um, we are going to turn to the Super Chat now uh, and do some, uh, some of the big Super Chat. And then I promise to review a couple of songs, although I might have to postpone the songs the next time, given how late it is. So we'll see about the songs. Uh, we might postpone them, but let's start with, let me see if there's any, any here. Um, yeah, uh, let, let's start with Wes. Uh, okay, let's, uh, let's start with Wes. Wes says, with principles like this, is it any wonder that the independent thinkers, young and old, run away from this crap straight into the arms of the left? Absolutely right. Uh, the left is just as bad but its irrationality is easier to swallow than ancient religion. I think for young people it is. Uh, for many of us it isn't, but for young people it is. The, 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 the irrationality, I mean, it's, it's impossible to take seriously people who, who, who think like this about family, people who think like this about religion, people like think about this about the Bible, think, people who think like this about education, people who think like this about the role of government. This is reactionary. This is old. This is... Young people want idealism. This is, this is, so they turn to the left, which is all disgustingly bad. Both sides are horrible here. Okay, we're doing $50 questions. Um, Ashton says, there's not much difference between the hammer and the sickle and the swastika. Both ideologies preach class warfare and only difference is one does it through race and the other does it through socioeconomic status. But the killing and hate are the same. Yeah, absolutely. Communism and fascism and Nazism, all the same thing. They're all horrific. Um, and uh, the sad thing is that today, what you've got in America today is statism, statism, state, all, all different variations of statism. Some of it's worse, some of it better. But all variations of statism. Uh, there's no pretense anymore of individualism or freedom or liberty. Uh, there is just tribalism and collectivism wherever you go. So uh, all of them, all the ideologies, including predominantly this national conservatism, are children 
of the hammer and sickle and the swastika. They're not quite there. But they're more, quote, moderate versions, right? They're, they're still as collectivist and they're still tribal. And, and, and again, no individual, is, no individual mentioned in, in this manifesto. Nothing. All right, let's see. DWN logic. Glenn Beck said he didn't think it was possible for an atheist to be happy. He made an exception. He said, you're on Brooke. Seems, seemed happy, even though he's a devoted atheist. This gave me some respect for his honesty. What was your relationship with Glenn? I actually had a really good relationship with Glenn Beck for many years. Um, I haven't seen him in a long, long time, but there, were, there were, was a period where I used to be on his Fox show pretty regularly, and then there was a period where I, was, um, where I used to go to Dallas and, and appear in his studio in Dallas. And... Um, you know, he always treated me with respect. He always uh, let me talk. We always disagreed, uh, agreed to disagree. The turning point, and he's really ignored me since, the turning point came when he became, when he sh shifted to being pro-Trump. Uh, when he was anti-Trump, he was very friendly with me and, and uh, was willing to kind of be on the same platform, if you will. As soon as he became a devotee of Trump, or at least pretended to be pro-Trump or whatever you want to call it, he completely, um, he stopped take, uh, re responding to my emails, he responded, invi inviting me to his shows, respond, uh, stopped responding everything. So it all became, and this is the damage Trump has done. This is the, the catastrophe that has been Trump, is that the better people, or the people that at least dealt respectfully with people like me, are gone because Trump either made them flip or kicked them out. So uh, uh, I, I am no longer, uh, I am, I think, persona non grata with, with Glenn Beck, or at least he has made no overtures. I used to be on, a sh on, 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 the, on the, uh, the network he had, The Blaze, all the time. I used to have a radio show on The Blaze. You remember I had a radio show on The Blaze? Long time ago. It feels like it ancient history now. Harper Campbell, do you think Americans don't accept when their lives suck? In other countries, having a miserable existence is something to be expected based on your class. But in the United States, if your life is miserable, it is unacceptable and something must be done. I think for the most part that's right, but I think again that is part of what is changing. Because the fact is that um, uh, the fact is that People have become more and more accepting of their fate. People have become less and less ambitious. Uh, I think Americans have changed. Americans are not as adamant about making their lives better, about taking their fate into their own hands, about doing something about it as they used to be. Uh, but it is true that part of being an American in the past was not accepting that life sucks and doing something about it. And by the way, not expecting anybody else to deal with it, doing it yourself. Now they expect other people to manage their lives, to solve their problems. Right? That's what they expect. But that's a change. That's a real change. In, it used to be that Americans believed they would raise themselves by their own bootstraps. All right, by the way, we're still like $260 short. So even though we got some great uh, questions here, a lot of support very early on, a lot of $50, like four $50 questions right off the bat. We're still $264 short of the goal. Uh, Catherine is here, so I'm sure we'll make it because um, she always pulls it through in the end. But um, please, use the Super Chat to ask a question. Uh, we're only taking, because it's so late, $20 questions or above would be great. Um, so... Uh, Feel free to jump in with the $20, $50, $100, $200 questions so we can make our goal and uh, you can feel good about, uh, uh, you know, uh, providing value for value. Seymour asked a $10 question, but it's relevant to my answer from a few minutes ago, so I'll take it. Uh, he says, thanks for doing this top... Uh, wait a minute, let me just find it again. There it is. Thanks for, doing, thanks for doing this topic. I was leaning to voting for Blake despite being a Trump fanboy. But now I'll take some extra time and educate myself more. Nice to finally meet you at Ocon. Hey, Seymour. Seymour. Seymour's the guy. 
Simo's the guy who kicked me out of poker. God, and and he beat me at he beat me at poker. I think we both had a pair of aces, right? Uh, there was an ace on the flop, and we each had an ace. I had ace queen. He had ace king, and he wiped me out. That that was the hand that did it. I was out. So, Simo is the man, um, and I hope. I hope you come uh, to Miami because it, it'll be time for revenge. It'll be time for revenge. And all you guys should come to Miami so we can all play poker. It's a lot of fun. You can ask Simo. He had a lot of fun. He made it at the, the final table and did really well. Did really well. Good good poker player. Um, all right. Uh, Simo, I would definitely look at other people. Uh, there's got to be, I mean, uh, it's not just that Blake is a Trump fanboy. Is these committed to these ideas. He's, he really is. I've, and I, by the way, I know Blake personally. I've known Blake for a long time. He's, he's worked for, for Teal for, for, for years and years and years. Uh, Teal goes back and forth between being a libertarian, being a fan of Ayn Rand, and being a national conservative. And he switches every three months, or every three years, really. He switches um, uh, which attitude he has uh, within this world. Um, Blake, I think, has always been more on this side and has kind of moved maybe Peter Thiel even towards this agenda. So I would definitely not vote for Blake. All right, let's do a few $20 questions. And then I'll fi when I finish the $20 questions, we're going to do a couple of songs. We're going to do Queen, the Prophet song, and we're going to do um, this Japanese song, Akuma no Ko, Akuma no Ko. Uh, I'll give you my review of those songs. Um, uh, thank you, uh, John. So we're slowly itching towards our goal, but, uh, but you guys are going to have to step up here. All right, Michael. Uh, Michael says, uh, Ted Cruz has come out against gay marriage. Yes, he has, and said the Supreme Court was wrong to legalize it. This is the Ted Cruz so many objectivists were excited about in 2016. I, I never liked the guy. Is this still the land of liberty? No. Is it becoming the land of conservatism? Yes. I think I will sit out the midterms. Thoughts? I mean, here's my thinking about the midterms, and you'll hear more about this as we get closer to the midterms. I want the Republicans to win the House because I want more stalemate in Washington. But I want the Republican sen the, the, the Senate candidates who are Trump-affiliated Masters, J.D. Vance, Dr. Oz, there may be a couple more. I want them to lose. I want them to lose. I do not want the Republicans to take the Senate. I do not want the Trumpian national conservative type candidates to win. I want gridlock. But I want, I, I want gridlock to be achieved without providing a boost to the worst elements within the Republican Party, the Trumpian, power-lusting, national conservative-leaning part of the Republican Party. I want them to lose. So in the House, it doesn't matter if any individual House member wins or loses. It doesn't matter that much. Even if I hate their ideas, it doesn't matter if they win or lose because, yes, I'm very Machiavellian, have been for years, because nobody, they don't have a national platform. Senators have a national platform. And if... A bunch of Trump-like candidates win in the Senate, that'll send a real message about where the Republican Party is heading. So I'm still hoping the Republican Party will reject Trump. And to do that, we have to reject J.D. Vance. We have to reject Blake Masters. We have to reject Dr. Oz. And we have to reject a couple of two or three other others. It's $100 to review a song, guys. So if you want me to review a song, it's 100 bucks. Lion King. I'd, I'd review Lion King's song for, for that. Right. All right. Uh, Michael. Michael has a $20 question. How come not every dictatorship initiates aggression? Singapore has a dictatorship and has never started any military action against their neighbors. If dictators have capitalist economies, does that make them more docile? Uh, it's not an issue of the economies. Look, Singapore is small. It's, it, it, it doesn't have, who's it going to fight? It's going to invade Malaysia? Malaysia would swamp it just by size. Um, 
And not every dictatorship is going to be, is going to invade other countries because they might be too busy uh, domestically. They might not be militarily powerful enough to invade another country. So dictatorships don't necessarily lead to war, but they often do. But it's not a necessity. There are many, many, many dictators who did not go to war. Pinochet did not go to war. Many of the South American dictators didn't go to war. The, many of them are too busy oppressing their own people and sometimes making money for themselves. In Singapore's case, uh, one of the reasons they couldn't go to war, I think, is that people have a good life in Singapore. And I don't think they would want to go die you know, for, for some expansionist reason that had nothing to do with self-defense. So in that sense, the extent that the economy is free, to some extent, Singapore's economy is far from capitalist, but it's, it's more free than many other countries, then people get rich and people get successful and they don't want to then sacrifice their lives for a cause they don't believe in. And that restrains, would restrain the dictator, and that's certainly the case in Singapore. But Singapore, the main reason is it's small. Uh, Emmanuel, thoughts on Matt Welsh. Walsh, pretty typical, horrible conservative views, but his attacks on the left are very funny. Yeah, I mean, the guy can be funny. Uh, to some extent, he's effective in, in some things. He's effective, um, but he's, he's a horrible theocrat. He's horrible in these issues. He's very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I was going to review this video he does on self-esteem where he says there is no such thing as self-esteem. You don't esteem yourself. You shouldn't esteem yourself. Now, he puts down the left's version of self-esteem and, you know, he ignores the proper perspective on self-esteem. But he's just, he's just a, he's got a, he's, he's, he found uh, Atlas Shrugged boring, couldn't get through it, didn't like it. He's not much of an intellectual, he has good funny put-downs of the left. That's about it. But in the name of what? In the name of Christianity again. In the name of religion. That's all they've got. That's all they've got. Thomas, isn't an article of faith for both national conservatives and religious cons that the sexual revolution, not say communism or Nazism, collectivism in general, is the worst thing that happened in the 20th century? Suddenly they believe that is true for, the, for America. I mean, there's no question, if you read Chazoni, if you read some of these others, the thing that really destroy, is destroying America is the sexual revolution because it's destroying the family and it's allowing for sexual experimentation, God forbid. Um, that, that is the essence of, you know, remember in, in, in what I talked about with, with the conservative nationals, family is at the center, the heart, the key for all of it. And, and, and God, right? And, and, and God and associate with God, when they talk about morality, much of what they're talking about is sexual morality. For them, sexual morality is, is right up here. And sexual morality means monogamous and, and uh, no, no sex before marriage. To them, that's equal to uh, the Ten Commandments. It's right up there with shall not kill and all of that. So uh, to them... And why is it, why do they hate it so much? I mean, fundamentally, they hate it so much because the sexual revolution is so individualistic. It's, I mean, what is sex if not about individual pleasure? Once, it's not about making kids, which is what the sexual revolution makes it, right? Sexual revolution is a product of the pill. It's a product of the ability to have sex without the consequences of pregnancy. So it liberates one's ability to have sex without worrying constantly about pregnancy. And that liberates us to pleasure. It liberates us to experience one of the great parts of human life, sex, without it necessitating pregnancy, children. They hate the pill. They hate contraception because it allows us to experience sex for pleasure. And the thing that they hate the most is individualism, is sex is not about making kids. That's for animals. We're human beings. We can have sex, and indeed, most of the sex we have is not about making kids. 
We can conceptualize the purpose of sex. We can make sex serve our purposes. And the purpose here is pleasure. The purpose here is visibility. The purpose here is exaltation. The purpose of sex is not to have kids. It's to celebrate life. It's to celebrate being alive. It's the achievement of happiness. And that they resent, that they hate. The same as Richard, because they reject the individual, they reject reason, they reject your ability to shape your own life, you shape your own mind. They reject the idea of pleasure for pleasure's sake. They reject the idea of happiness for controlling your own destiny. I mean, sexual liberation is one of the great things that have happened to women. And the idea that sexual liberation has been bad for women is a male idea that comes from men who would like to see women back in the kitchen, would like to see women back where they, quote, belong, raising kids and in the kitchen and taking care of their man. But that's men who hold that view, a weak, low self-esteem men who can't handle a woman who might make more money than they do. That would terrify them, terrify them. They would fall apart completely. Women these days look much happier to me than men because men can't handle the strong women that exists out there. And to a large extent, that's because of this sexual revolution. All right, John, Barry Goldwater would be an odd duck among today's conservatives. Yeah, I mean, forget it. Barry Goldwater wouldn't get elected even in Arizona. Uh, Barry Goldwater wouldn't have a chance in today's Republican Party and in this conservative movement. Not a chance, even though he gave lip service to religion, they wouldn't take him. No way. All right, let's do this. Let's, um, yeah, I've got another half an hour. So uh, we're short $230. Uh, we'd really like to make the goal today. It's important that we stick to our, uh, our schedule. We're a little behind this month because we've done fewer shows in the first half of the month. So we really need to, to get to, to the 650 today. So hopefully some of you out there uh, are, are willing to, uh, Catherine, who is in charge of all this, keeps contributing money. She keeps going at it, $5 there for Catherine. Um, but so we need $225. Maybe we've got a whale out there with, uh, with 100 bucks that is uh, willing to get us closer, or maybe just somebody who does 250. But that would be great. I'm going to do quickly these two songs. I'm not going to have a huge amount of time to do a lot of uh, questions. So any questions that come in, please make them 20 or above with the emphasis on above. There has to be somebody out there that would like to support the show at 50 or 100 bucks. That would be great. All right. Let's start with a prophet song by Queen. Um, let me, one second, let me just do this. Uh, all right, so this is, um, thank you for whoever uh, uh, suggested uh, a review of the prophet song. Um, the prophet song is from, um, uh, you know, the album A Night at the Opera, which was a, um, a uh, one of the albums, uh, one of my favorite albums when I was growing up. So this is mid-70s. I was a teenager, and it's an album I, I owned. Um, it's, uh, it's an album that, um, you know, the, the generally, what, did, what are we doing here? You know, Bohemian Rhapsody became, um, became, is still one of my favorite rock uh, pieces ever. Uh, but there are other, there's a bunch of songs on this album that are fantastic, that I really love. I think it was also a breakthrough album. KFAX, thank you, really appreciate that. And he's asking for another music review. 
Um, it was, I think, a, a pretty revolutionary album in a sense that uh, it, it was a, it was an important album in the uh, in the whole sphere of progressive rock of storytelling through rock. It was a album that, that you know where you had uh, the Prophet song, which is eight plus minutes, and you had Bohemian Rhapsody, which was almost six minutes, and and that was revolutionary and new. Uh, and uh, so this was an important, I think, album uh, at the time, and uh, and changed. Uh, to some extent, the face of, uh, of rock and roll back then. Um, and it's one, it's an album I enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed greatly. Uh, I like the Prophet song. It's not my favorite on the album. Uh, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody uh, certainly is my favorite, but it is uh, certainly an enjoyable uh, piece of rock music. It is a, um, it is a, uh, you know, a, 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 a it, it, it's got some great melodies. It, it what I, I like the long I, I like long rock pieces. I like um, the change in kind of tempo. I like the opening and the closing, which is kind of an acoustic guitar, or maybe it's not acoustic but a guitar solo. I like the the, the melodies. This song has a lot of you know they play with harmonies a lot. Generally, Queen played a lot with harmonies. Um, you know, the parts here, which I think are a little boring and, and repetitive, now I know, now I know, now I know, it goes on a little bit too much, uh, la, 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 la. Whenever a song gets to, they don't sing anything, but they just do la, 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 you know, something is off. Uh, I, I love, you know, I, I really enjoyed Queen. It was part of growing up. It was part of my teen years. Uh, so I have a lot of fond memories of Queen songs and, and, and uh, enjoying listening to Queen at the time and, uh, I bought all their albums, uh, you know, so uh, Queen was one of my favorites in those days. Uh, and I still enjoy listening to the music. I still enjoy listening to the music. It's, it's a nice music to drive, um, to drive uh, with. But the song is a little thin. Um, Lyrics-wise, you know, this, is, this should be, I, 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 as I was listening to it, I, I, I was thinking, this song is Greta's song. This is Greta's song, right? This is a song about the prophet who comes down and says, listen to me, the world is coming to an end. You're destroying the planet. Everything is going to die. Everything is going to collapse. Take this seriously. I am the prophet. It reminded me of Greta. It's got that anger. Um, it's got that, that, that uh, you know, uh, 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 kind of uh, crazy-ness of kind of the, uh, uh, a prophet. Um, so it's... Uh, you know, children of the land, quick into the new life. You need a completely change. You need a new life. Oh, you know, we need to we need to bring you pair by pair onto Noah's Ark. So it's got this biblical thing. It's got this environmentalist thing. It's Greta came to mind as I was listening to this, which was not a pleasant thought, unfortunately. This is uh, the Prophet's song by Queen uh, from uh, Night at the Opera, the album. Again, I like their vocals, I like their harmonies, I like the melody, I like the riffs. Could have been a couple of minutes shorter, a little bit too much repetition, but, you know, it's a song I enjoy partially because it's a song that reminds me of my teen years, which were not particularly good, but not particularly bad either. And, uh, and it was uh, so enjoyable. Generally, I'm a fan of Queens. Now, this one was interesting. Um, this is a request to review Akuma no Ko by Ai Higuchi. And uh, three versions, I got links for three versions. One is the original, one the English cover, and one a piano version of this. Piano version of this. And uh, this is from, I guess, an anime movie, The Atta Attack on Titan. Um, that's, the, that's the context for the song. It's some kind of rejection of racism, supposedly. I, I, I couldn't really get that from the, from the words. Um, so I don't know what the song is about. I really don't. It's got some great lines, which I really like, but it's clearly a, a figure that is torn, right? That is torn, uh, that, is, uh, that is eternally torn, psychologically torn is dealing with real conflict. 
it's a, a, a song full of drama, and it, it's, it's in some ways operatic in terms of the range uh, the singer reaches. Uh, I have to say, I really enjoyed it. I particularly liked the Japanese version. I thought, I thought the English version was kind of a little lame. The piano version was pretty. Again, I don't think I could hear it many times, but it certainly held my interest. It was interesting. It was pretty. It was, um, it, it was, it was, uh, um, you know, uh, it was interesting, enjoyable. The Japanese version, and I watched a light performance of the Japanese version by the composer, I think, I, Higuchi. Um, and it was um, powerful dramatic, um, real uh, emotional. So emotion is clearly conveyed and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and really exciting. So I, I found the music enjoyable, uh, interesting. And then the words, here's, here's uh, words are, uh, are values oriented, although obviously there's a conflict. The, the person sees evil in themselves and is trying to fight it. Um, but so, so the chorus is, the world is cruel, and yet I still love you. Even if I sacrifice everything, I'll still protect you. Even if I'm wrong, I don't doubt myself, because what's right is to firmly believe in yourself. I mean, there's subjectivism there. The, you know, there's real problems there, but it's about... I'm going to fight. I'm a fighter. I believe in myself. I'm going to do what I can. Um, again, uh, the chorus later on, this world is really cool, but even so, I will still love you. Even if I sacrifice everything, I will protect you. The shadow of the person whom I chose, the corpse of what I threw, I noticed that what is growing inside me is the child of evil behind justice, inside of sacrifice, there is a child of evil inside my heart. This is where the torn between some kind of evil tendency. So I don't, again, I guess you'd have to know the movie and you'd have to know the anime to know what this is about. But I thought the, the music really uh, um, projected the, the value orientation, the emotion, and the conflict that the, that the song presented. So I thought... It was uh, quite successful. Again, I also enjoyed the piano music. It's very melodic. It's very pretty, um, and and reflects the drama. Even in the even in the piano, you can tell the drama. Uh, I didn't like the English version particularly. All right, uh, let's get back to the questions. Uh, I'll just note that we're a hundred dollars short, one hundred and three. Where is uh, Catherine? Catherine's taken off for some reason. Uh, and disappeared on me. So uh, where's Catherine? She's supposed to be promoting um, the 100. Uh, Action Jackson is reminding me that um, uh, I, I, at the end of the month, we've got a private front row event, which is fewer than 20 people with me, kind of a Q&A. I present some material. It's a Q&A. This will be on, um, uh, on uh, individualism. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you can uh, you can join us for that. It's hundred dollars. The link is uh, is posted above, so you can uh, you can go in and sign in and pay for it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's on a Saturday, uh, middle of the day. Hopefully you can join me. Hopefully we'll get twenty people. Um, maybe it's limited to fourteen. I can't remember. But anyway, um, Catherine is contributing a lot of money here. Uh, she she did she just gave three dollars to make it around one hundred, um, and Emmanuel just gave twenty dollars, saying, "Hey, Catherine, you're doing a great job. Thanks, Emmanuel." Um, and uh, all right, let's see. KFAX. Oh, it's a movie review. Yes, I already got that. Thank you, KFAX. Thanks for the hundred dollars. Wow, that's uh, very generous. Really appreciate that and. And I will, I will get you the movie review, the uh, music review. I've got that down. All right, Richard says January six hearings should have a goal to keep Trump from getting elected. I agree. Why does the government resist goals and objectives? Well, I mean, because 
you know, the January 6th is supposed to be non-political in that sense. It's supposed to just give us the facts. I think if we, anybody who objectively examines the fact would, would, it would lead you to the conclusion that Trump cannot, should not be elected, given what happened on January 6th, and, and given how he behaved on that day, he is not electable. Indeed, he should have been impeached in January, you know, 2021, for what happened on January 6th. The Republicans failed, as they always do, uh, to achieve that, but he should have been impeached, and that would have prevented him from running again, and that would have changed the dynamics of the Republican Party, of the conservative movement of, of the election of 2024. Um, by not impeaching him, they, they sustained and maintained his power over the political party, which is horrific, I think, for the future of the country. Frank asks, 14 Peaks, uh, nothing is impossible, a wonderful Netflix film about a high achiever, literally. I'll look for that. Thank you. Is it a documentary or, or a story? It sounds like a documentary. I wonder uh, if it's fiction or nonfiction. Um, but I'll copy it down so I remember to watch it. Friend Harper um, <clears throat> says, they are trying to communicate with the notion of wishing death on strangers you have never met and might have a lot in common with. They feel bad that they wish death on people over things they don't fully understand. Wow, because I don't get that from the song. So... It, that is, it's interesting, although, again, I, I, I don't actually get it from the song. But there is real drama and real suspense, and it, it makes you want to know what the backstory is, because there's a real conflict going on here, which is important. But I, I, I don't get that from the lyrics. You have to have a lot more background, I guess, for that. It's, and it, to some extent, it's, it's, um, it's film music more than it is a song, right? Although I think it works. I, I by the way, like songs the lyrics of which I don't understand because I find that um, I can enjoy them more when I don't understand the lyrics because uh, it, that is they're in a different language because um, I can imagine my own lyrics to them. You know, I, I can project my own conflict onto it. I can project my own love story or whatever the, ha whatever the, 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 the music is evoking. Daniel, would you personally stick with a career that could be very rewarding but had potentially significant long-term health risks? And probably not. Uh, it's also, of course, depends on how much I love the career. So I, I, I wouldn't exchange money for health risk. But if I loved the career, maybe, uh, being a you know, soldier, firefighter, uh, policeman, uh, uh, careers if you love and they have, certainly have health risks, so I can see loving the career and exchanging it for health risk. Just for the money, I wouldn't do it. Um, but so you, you have to add that factor in. And then the other fact I would consider is what are my alternatives? Is the alternative being dirt poor? Is the alternative doing another job I don't like? What is the alternative? So, so you, two factors you're missing from the question which I would need in order to make a decision, you need in order to make a decision. And I think we've talked about, you've, you've asked this before. One is how much you love the, the job, and two is what are your alternatives? Can you take a job that is not destructive to your health that you would love also, and that would pay equivalent or reasonably close? All right, oh, Ashton is taking us over the 650 limit. Thank you, Ashton. Um, any advice for young writers in this crazy world? Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, uh, take, listen to Ayn Rand's writing courses, both the fiction and nonfiction writing courses. Um, if you can afford to, uh, I assume you're a fiction writer. Um, you know, take fiction writing classes, but start with Ayn Rand's, but, but take fiction writing classes and read a lot and figure out what you like about the things that you read and, and, and what you can learn from their success. And read good literature. Don't just, you know, read Hugo, read Dostoevsky, read Tolstoy even. 
um, to get a sense of what great literature can look like. Right? So read. Read a lot. And if you're a fiction writer, read a lot of fiction. And read the best fiction. The best fiction that you can. So that you, get, you, you have a standard. I, I would read Dostoevsky. I would read Tolstoy. I would read, uh, you know, uh, the, the Romantics of the 19th century. I would read anybody who's good, really good at the art of writing, even if you don't agree with him philosophically, even if you don't like you know, like, like uh, the naturalism of Tolstoy. He's a great writer. The way he uses words, the way he uses, the way he conveys Shakespeare, the, you know, the way they convey ideas, the way they express themselves in writing is unbelievably powerful, and you can learn from any one of them, even when you don't agree with what they have to say, even when you're not enjoying the novel itself. Liam, are you sure animals aren't conceptual at all? I grew up with dogs, and they get jealous. Is jealousy genetic? They must form some evaluations. Yeah, they form evaluations at the perceptual level. They form evaluations of, uh, you know, I like this person because he feeds me, or I like this person because I like the way he pets me or he takes care of me. So at the very simple, uh, the relationship of sensation, you know, at the level of perception, they can identify you, for example. But they can't do anything conceptual. Conceptual. So they know at an emotional level they want attention. But they don't have a concept of jealousy or they don't have a concept of, ooh, I, I want his attention. You know, they just know, oh, I'm not, him giving that other person attention is, is, reminds me of the fact that I'm not getting attention right now. But that's at the perceptual level. That's at the emotional level, not at the conceptual level. Now. Could they have very, very primitive concepts? Maybe. I doubt dogs. I, I, it, it's like the chimpanzees, apes, and so on have some very, very simplistic. Michael, did Plato believe in a welfare state, or did later Platonic thinkers come up with it as a means of securing philosopher kingdom? You know, I don't know. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, obviously wouldn't think of it as a welfare state, but I, I can't remember if in the Republic there is welfare. It seems like a, a natural consequence of the Republic, a natural consequence of kind of some of Plato's thinking, but I don't know if he explicitly advocates for the equivalent of welfare, welfare for ancient Greece. Uh, Daniel says, thanks, Catherine, for reason beaver. I'm not even sure what that is. All right, Michael says, going back to what you said yesterday, does fear come from low self-esteem and often converts to hatred? For example, fear of immigrants now turns into hating and bashing them. It can, but it doesn't have to. Again, fear can be rational. Fear can be somebody with high self-esteem can be afraid if he's in a circumstances with justified fear, right? on the battlefield, you know, in front of a, I don't know, in, a, in front of a hurricane, in the midst of a, of a mugging. I mean, there are lots of places where you should feel fear, even if you have a high self-esteem. But it's true that people who learn to fear things that, that they should not fear land up hating it. So the two, I agree with you that immigrants is a good example. They fear the immigrants, which converts it into hate, right? They fear them because they take their jobs. They think they take their jobs. They fear them because they, um, they're different from them. They fear them because uh, they're being told they, you know, they're criminals. They just fear them because they're different. They're not them, of, of their people. And then that converts into hate because they have low self-esteem, and it's all related. So both here and fear and hate can be products of self uh, low self-esteem, but not necessarily products of low self-esteem. Naveen asks, could you do a high-level recap of yesterday's Democrats just for context? I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, yesterday, my recap was that, that the left is destroying the universities, 
and if it's a self-reinforcing mechanism by which the universities are destroyed, so there's almost no hope for the universities. There's no way out of the self-reinforcing mechanism. Uh, and that they are destroying the universities by destroying free speech, by destroying um, uh, academic freedom, by destroying uh, you know, the, 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 the ability to have a variety of different points of view, and by inculcating uh, the universities with a philosophy and ideology of uh, emotionalism and subjectivism and, and of some, you know, and racism. So that's my overview. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, just a quick reminder to like the show before you leave. Just give it a thumbs up. It helps with the algorithms. It helps with YouTube. It helps uh, get them to promote the show a little bit more. So the more comments we get, the more interaction, the more likes, the more interaction there is, the more we have. Um, James says, the transformation of charity into legal entitlement has produced donors without love and recipients without gratitude. Yeah, that is good. Uh, just as Scalia wasn't particularly good, but that is, a, that is good. Um, and it's, it's much more than that. It's not, it's, it's yeah, but it, that's, that's the beginning of an analysis, but it's much worse than just that. Um, Thomas Schubert, isn't there a huge overlap with the na na national cons and religious cons? Yes. So the theocrats, uh, the real theocrats, the, the, the Catholic integrationalists, overlap with the na national cons. So, but the theocrats believe in any, everything the national cons believe, uh, nationalist conservatives, plus they're willing to be much more illiberal. You see, uh, they're willing to be much more authoritarian they're willing to be much more theocratic. But there is an overlap. Many of the people ascribe to both. And, and look, the, 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 um, the, anti, uh, the, the uh, uh, theocrats are the more consistent. And therefore, the movement is going to be towards them, not towards moderating the national conservatives, not towards more individualism, but towards less individualism, more collectivism, and more, much, much, much more religion. All right, friend Harper. A contribution for the suffering of having to know this manifesto exists. I don't drink to forget things, but I'm tempted to give it a shot. Dim hypothesis is scary prophetic. Yes, it is. Yes, it is is scary prophetic. Robert, do you ever find that you dislike a piece of music, either a song or orchestral composition, and need to hear it several times before you enjoy and appreciate it? True of some of my favorites. Yes, absolutely. Um, the more complex the music, the more difficult it is to like it the first time, and you have to hear it a few times. It took me a long time to like Mahler, for example. I, I like a lot of Mahler. There's still things I don't like about Mahler. And it's definitely depressing music. But uh, Mahler, Mahler, you know, there's some stuff of Mahler's that I really love. But it took me a, it took me a few listens to get there. It's less so with, um, with popular music. Most popular music you like or you don't like in the first try. Very little. I mean, some Pink Floyd, you know, I remember I, I had to listen to a few times before I got it. I think some of the more complex um, uh, progressive rock of old, but, but most of popular music I either like or dislike from the first hearing. Classical music is much harder. Uh, that's true of uh, all forms of classical music, including also jazz. Sometimes you don't get the jazz piece, and then you hear it a second or third time, and you, you, you get it. Sometimes it has to do with the phase of life. You might not like a piece of music uh, early in life, and you might enjoy it later on. I didn't like jazz when I was young. I, I've come more and more to enjoy jazz as I got older. Leonard Peikoff actually introduced me really to jazz. Um, so yes, I think that's absolutely the case. 
But I find that it's less so with regard to uh, popular music and more so with regard to classical. Um, Ashton, is this all because of fear of the left? Well, I think it gets, I, I assume you're talking about the national conservatives. I think a lot of it is that, but a lot of it is intellectual rejection of the left, which they lump together with intellectual rejection of liberalism, which ultimately is intellectual rejection of the founding fathers, particularly of Jefferson. Um, so, so a lot of what they're advocating is, 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 is the rejection of classical liberalism uh, and, and everything that it implies, and that goes back to the founders. But the people support this. The, the reason this has credence, the reason it is going to succeed, in my view, politically, the reason it has legs politically, the reason that I fear this more than anything else is because it, is, it appeals to people's fear of the left. It's the only solution to people's rejection of the left. It is, and it's an integrated view of the world, integrated around the nation and religion, those two pillars, exactly, exactly as Leonard Peacock predicted. I mean, it's just unbelievable how accurate the dim hypothesis is, Leonard Peacock's dim hypothesis, when it comes to the national conservatives. Daniel says, I want you on to review Black Dog by Led Zeppelin. The only song I really love by Led Zeppelin is Stay Away to Heaven. Thank you, Daniel, for, for the support. Uh, then he says, you want to review Band Slayer. Don't know Band Slayer. That would be weird. All right, last question from Fred Hop Friend Harper. Thanks for reviewing the song. Glad you liked it. Music from anime is often rich with values, stressing love through virtue and not through lust being strong to gain and keep values. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Fred Harper, for exposing me to that. Um, I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all the support. Thanks for allowing us uh, to get to 650. We made 659 um, in 91 cents, so that's great. Um, next show is going to be on Tuesday at 8 p.m., uh, we've got to catch up on the news. We'll, we'll talk about, there's a bunch of things from the news. We'll talk about Saudi Arabia. I want to, I want to do a show on Saudi, uh, talk about Saudi Arabia. We'll talk about Biden in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and we'll talk about other stuff from the news. So Tuesday would be news. And then uh, we'll do a, a, a Iran's Rules for Life. We'll do either Thursday or, or on the weekend. Uh, and then uh, a week from Thursday, we've got Gene Maroney coming on to talk about happiness, to talk about introspection. So uh, I think a lot of the questions you've asked me that sometimes I've, I've not answered completely, I think you're going to get great answers from Gene on them. So don't forget to, don't forget to tune in. Uh, that's a week from Thursday. All right, guys. Guys, um, see you on Tuesday, 8 p.m. East Coast time. Bye, everybody.